If you love playing the bass at any level, we invite you to experience this colorful history of our instrument. Meet the great teachers, soloists, and entertainers from the jazz, classical, and electric bass world. I'm Barry Green, the bass teacher from Ohio State's new Tamashev Family Music Building. Join me and my co-host Jason Heath for some fun clinics, interviews, and performances from the legends and heroes of our past and present. On the base, India. This next section is about string crossings. We're going to all use our open strings, and I suggest at the beginning use adjacent strings. For example, the first set of string crossings might be like this. <laughs> As the exercise progress with different string crossings, you can engage a string crossing with two strings or three strings and go or even the rest is on the video. Enjoy your string crossing workout.
What's going on? It's Jason Heath, and we're talking today about Carl Ditters von Dittersdorf. I've always been curious about these von or van names. To give it the perfect ending was a bit of the old Ludwig van. So the big question for today, who was Dittersdorf? Dittersdorf was born in Vienna in 1739. His father was a military tailor in the Austrian Imperial Army under Charles VI. Aww. Unlike a lot of composers, Dittersdorf seemed kind of happy. He studied violin and composition, and in 1754 was hired as a court composer for, okay, I'll take a stab at this, Prince Josef of Saxe Hildburghausen. This whole court composer world seems fascinating to me. I mean, what would it have been like to be alive in those days? Okay, maybe not like that. He became acquainted with Christoph Gluck, who had just achieved greatness as an opera composer. In 1763, he traveled to Bologna with Gluck, a trip which would have a great impression on his future work as a composer. In 1764, Dittersdorf was given the position of court composer in Johannesburg in the modern-day Czech Republic. This was when he also met the great Josef Haydn, who would become one of his closest friends. Since this new post required a title, Dittersdorf was sent to Vienna and given the noble title of von Dittersdorf. His full surname thus became Ditters von Dittersdorf, but he's usually referred to simply as Dittersdorf. Johann von Hall was perhaps Dittersdorf's most famous student. About 1785, Haydn, Dittersdorf, Mozart, and von Hall played string quartets together. Dittersdorf taking first violin, Haydn, second violin, Mozart, viola, and von Hall cello. His autobiography, which was completed just three days before his death, is a fascinating document and window into what it was like being a court composer and the whole culture of European aristocracy at the time. Here's Cornel Lecomte, principal double bass of Belgium's National Opera on Dittersdorf's autobiography. I read that and I couldn't stop reading because it's, it's just, <laughs> every page is full of surprises and how people lived back then. And he's very full of himself, Dittersdorf. You can, you can see that. but. At the same time, it's it's so interesting to to see how they lived and how his life went and how life at the court went and and you just wish you could be there just for just for a while, maybe an hour, or just to have this impression and bring it back to the modern world. This leads us to our second topic, which is why is his bass concerto so popular, especially in Europe? First, let's clear up a few points of confusion about the Dittersdorf concerto, although this might actually muddy the waters, so we'll see. One of the big challenges is the tuning system of the time. Composers like Dittersdorf wrote for the bass in Viennese tuning, which can be confusing for bassists who aren't familiar with that. You really, I can really only encourage bass players to try it, just try it. You take an A and a D and a G one step, one semitone lower, and a top A from solo set, and you have your strings, modern strings. And then you try and you you play around with it, and you'll never go back to the modern bass. <laughs> you'll go back to it, but you'll go back with a different mindset. Though it's not an easy piece, even in Viennese tuning, there's certainly an extra level of awkwardness that results from playing this in typical perfect fourths double bass tuning. It was in 1767. Well, that's a time ago, yeah. So Viennese tuning so has this very great time. So and it was really La Mode in, in Vienna, the Viennese tuning, and a lot of very strong uh, um, uh, double basses. <laughs> Official edition happened in 1938 in Germany. For 150 years in between, the Dittes of Composite. He 
she saw, oh, there are some some things very difficult to play. So we, uh, yeah. So he made an addition for chord tuning. <laughs> The double bass, or more accurately, the instrument filling the double bass role at this time, was quite non-standardized. In this region around Vienna, it was referred to as the Viennese double bass, the Viennese bass violone, and even the Viennese tuned bass. Lots of non-standardization in the bass world, even back in this time. To keep things simple, I'll just call it the violone going forward here. And this instrument flourished because of certain political and economic conditions of the time. In this case, the patronage of the Habsburg family within the 18th century Holy Roman Empire helped to create a melting pot of music creation, leading to a massive upswing for artistic jobs, these composers and performers that we're talking about today. Aww. Basically, all these nobles wanted bragging rights for having the swankiest court in town. In this era, older music was almost never performed. Concert programs at the time were filled with new music, often composed by the court composer. This whole era witnessed a surge of patronage, with the dollars to back it and a public hungry for music. It was in this particular musical cauldron that the violone took off in popularity. The violone's secret weapon and its Achilles heel was its tuning system. Basically, this thing was optimized for D major, and that allowed for all kinds of fast passage work and arpeggiated passages all over the instrument. The instrument had codified into a five string model at this time, and it made keys like D, G, and A sound awesome on the bass. You can see in this list what keys were the most frequently played on the violone in solo music. We can break this golden age down into two separate generations of composers and performers. The first generation from around 1760 included Karl Ditters von Dittersdorf, Josef Haydn, and Frederick Pickelberger. I am the fearless And honor, I'll be famous in austerity. The second generation started around 1780 and included composers like Mozart, Hofmeister, Sperger, and von Hall. So, what happened? <laughs> Everything was going along great, this super cool era of virtuosity in this instrument. What happened? Well, this happened. And this happened. And then this happened.
like I said, the Violone's strengths ended up becoming its greatest weaknesses. That distinctive tuning system simply couldn't compete with the modern demands of chromaticism and modulation that composers were putting on it. Various other factors like the ever-growing size of the symphony orchestra and the perceived projection issues with the Violone led to the evolution of the modern double bass with the EADG fourths tuning. Luthiers started adapting their building techniques for these modern four-string basses, removing the frets and introducing heavier strings with sturdier construction overall to handle the increased pressure of these strings. By the 1850s, the Viennese violone was pretty much forgotten. There's a happy ending to this tale though. Interest in this era of music picked up in the last few decades of the 20th century and with pioneering researchers like Klaus Trumpf, a whole new generation of bassists has been introduced to this quirky but fascinating era of musical history.
Some, some pieces with very nice melodies. This is one of it. Um, well, it, it sounds good, but how would it sound with, with five double basses? I did uh, the arrangement for the opening concert of the Sperger competition in 2018. Jeff Beditec joined us, and Nas Kupatnik, Dan Stiv, and Hiroshi Ikematsu, so we were a very international quintet. Sperger, yes, many pieces. So a lot of chamber music and a lot of symphonies and also 18 double bass concerts. Competition uh, exists already since nearly 20 years, and uh, so next year we will have the 11th Sperger competition. You have it uh, every two years. So the pieces from Dittersdorf, Hofmeister, Van Hall you can play there, and uh, of course some pieces of Sperger. But it's also important that we have a commissioned piece every two years, so in my opinion, this is uh, one of the most important uh, works the Sperger Society is doing to bring every two years a new and a good composition.
You know, it sounds a little like a clave, so you can do. And I mean, it doesn't have to be complicated. It's good also, you know, just to play. It's easier with notes. Yeah, yeah. And then here's a, you know, whole set of strokes here. And really, it's just about, you know, putting these things together. So many different strokes, you know, with it. Thank you.